Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Let's start out with the silver chart. If this one doesn't look familiar, it should because it's almost the exact same pattern we had the last SmackDown. You can see we, we were going to rally. We were in the mid middle of a breakout there. You can see a test and then it was about to break into new highs and wham! Crash! Boom! Bang! They took it down uh, 60 cents almost and it looks like it's rolling over so pulling it out to the hourly chart uh, you can see this, the size of those red candlesticks get up to the daily you can see that uh, it's rolling over now so uh, the smackdown that we had we got just above where it happened and we're rolling over again the general downtrend you can see it here still um, lower highs and lower lows so we're going to be looking for a lower low uh, as I said before the best time to buy silver is when it's crashing uh, but uh, keep an eye on it we're going to look to penetrate $15 and then we're going to keep a very close eye on premiums uh, if we do get those prices to see if they expand normally as I pointed out in the past I really like to pull the trigger when I see premiums expand in the face of a crashing market because what that tells me is that people that are selling me that silver are selling at a loss and normally they peg using futures for example they will peg their prices but if the if the prices are such drastic moves or so low sometimes they're not fully hedged and when I see them start to inch up their premiums then that tells me that they're just on the edge of losing money or already are losing money and that's a good time to pull the trigger so let's get over and look at the cryptos uh, crazy crazy stuff going on we had that run in Bitcoin cash and it ran it really ran uh, it's it's pretty hard to get the numbers because it's still being sorted out from the exchanges and you can see that on this chart here it shows about $871 price but I remember it going over a thousand at one point and you can see it had a, a phenomenal crash back down into new lows uh, I have a friend who's playing it and trading it uh, but I've decided to stay away from it just like I would stay away from any new coin uh, based on let the market sort itself out and uh, before I take a position because what can happen is you know you can buy early and just get absolutely destroyed which happened to a lot of people here but we have Bitcoin moving into new highs today and significant ones not small ones at a 53.4 billion dollar market cap Bitcoin price coming in at 3229 you can see on Bitfinex 3233 uh, so a solid $3,200 on Bitcoin. Big move. You can see just straight through that 3000 price. Uh, sort of, I guess you could call it a relief rally. Um, but very, very strong. Remember that there's basically a one for one with Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. If you had one Bitcoin, you got one Bitcoin Cash. So you really, to look at the market cap, you have to add the price of Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash together. That gives us a price of $3,500. So we're way past that $3,003. We're $500 above that price. And that was a rapid move. Look at the market cap, total crypto market cap, $111 billion. Remember my prediction, not long after my prediction, that we could see a trillion dollar market ca uh, cap. We had a crash down to a $60 billion market cap from 130. We've made up uh, $51 billion of that already. You can see Ethereum is very strong. So Ethereum is rallying in the wake of this news. So keep an eye on Bitcoin Cash and see how that sorts itself out. Probably 200 bucks isn't going to be too bad of a price to get it. I can't see it going too much lower than that. Um, what's the ratio between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash? Uh, let's look at Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. Ethereum's $263 and Ethereum Classic is $15. 15 to 20 to 1 ratio. So 
Bitcoin Cash to Bitcoin is very, very close to that Ethereum, Ethereum Classic ratio. We'll just watch it and see what happens. So big story of the night is going to be Apple Computer. Uh, we'll start out with the chart here. This is the stock chart on big charts of Apple's weekly price. And you can see going back to 2004, it's practically a zero price. I think on this chart, it's like two. So an 80-fold move, you know, one of the biggest moves you're going to see in a stock. You know, cryptocurrencies can move a thousand-fold, but it's very difficult for stocks to move that much, especially when the market cap gets so large. And it is above $800 billion market cap. So uh, a very good move on the part of the Apple investors. And it, it appears, you can see, that's very similar to the Bitcoin trend. It looks like it's breaking out into new highs again. Uh, who knows where it could go if it actually goes parabolic. Double from here. But I want to take you to this zero hedge story. Fascinating story about Apple. And kind of piqued my interest because uh, I did not know that Apple holds so many U.S. treasuries. So the big question one would ask here is, is there kind of a... Um, nepotistic relationship between Apple and the Treasury. Why is Apple holding so many Treasuries? Is this a sort of backdoor QE? So let's explore this a little bit. This is the story. Apple now owns $51.5 billion in Treasuries more than Mexico, Turkey, or Norway. Every quarter, Apple manages to impress with its gargantuan cash hoard, which in quarter two rose to $262 billion which, however, is $153 billion net of debt, a new all-time high, as shown in the chart below. While it's widely known that of this $262 billion, the vast majority, or $246 billion, is held offshore, what is less appreciated is that Apple's actual cash is just $18.6 billion. The rest is held in various securities, both short and long term, something we first reported back in September when we introduced readers to Brayburn Capital, the firm that actually manages Apple's quarter trillion in asset holdings. In the five years that have passed since then, Apple's AUM has grown substantially. As the company reported in its latest 10Q, as of June 30th, Apple now owns enough assets to not only put even the world's largest hedge fund, Bridgewater, with less than $200 billion in assets to shame, but some of the world's largest holders of treasuries of its total $243 billion in short and long-term securities. Apple owned a whopping $51.5 billion in treasuries, split between $20.1 billion in T-bills and $31.3 billion in treasury bonds. While Apple's TSY holdings have fluctuated over the years, with a notable decline around September 2014, they have since grown to an all-time high of $51.5 billion, up from $50.9 billion last quarter and $40.5 billion last year's fiscal year end. Putting this number in context, if Apple were a sovereign nation, it would be the 24th largest holder of U.S. treasuries in the world, more than Turkey with $49.5 billion, Norway with $48.3 billion, and Sweden with $40.8 billion, Mexico with $38.9 billion. Still, nothing compares to Apple's major asset class, total corporate securities, which in quarter two hit a new all-time high, just above $150 billion, up from $54.6 billion five years ago. As for the rest of Apple's holdings, here's the full breakdown. It breaks down from corporates to uh, treasuries, mortgage back, etc. For a grand total of $261.5 billion, including $18.6 billion in cash, if the whole iPhone thing ever fails, Apple can just give active asset management a try. That said, we wonder how much Apple pays in broker fees each year and how much it gets back in the form of favorable sell side research. Now, that's kind of interesting, but what's even more interesting I wanted to explore was this comment by one of the posters here, starting with the first comment made by CPL, uh, and this is comment. They have a high credit rating, and it's cheaper to borrow money than make it with 0% interest, sort of like printing your own money just like the banks do. They use the treasuries as collateral to borrow a lot of money to buy back their stock to buy more treasuries with more loans, etc. Apple is called a credit front, 
and it stopped being a technology company when its principal owner and CEO died in 2011 of a very terminal bout of cancer. They were also always first to put forward commercial laws for literally thousands of different agendas, SOPA, PIPA, ACTA, Patriot Act 1 and 2. As a company, it's not a benign or friendly as it's presented. They're sort of a quasi scumbags. Personally, I think they're a front for someone else since no one actually buys their substandard crap. Whoever they are, they sell Apple the treasuries and sign the loans on the collateral. Only one group does that, the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. And he follows it up with this comment. They are less than 2% of a market space. They are outsold in nearly every category, and their products are 800 to 1,200% more expensive than their competitors. The links to that company and where you want to follow the money the names of the guilty are as follows, and he gives a bunch of names. Very high level connections to other organizations known to be complicit in the scam and murder charges that are now being brought to trial. The bailiff will remove the names on the list for processing soon enough. So a little bit of tongue in cheek there, but what about this point? Is Apple some kind of sophisticated money laundry uh, that we know that if you've ever followed, uh, well, if you watch the series that's now on Netflix called Ozark, which is about um, uh, laundering money, Mexican drug cartel money, and a guy who gets caught in that business. But, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, but in regards to laundering money, um, the question is, is, is Apple doing a legitimate business? Uh, I remember what I was going to say. Um, if, if you remember the gal who came from Treasury, uh, I can't remember her name right now. It's on the tip of my tongue. But her, the name of her uh, organization was Solaris. And she was always talking about how much drug money is laundered. And the story she gave was that... Uh, she was going around the country speaking to people about legalizing drugs and what the impact would be. And her statement was that it would be a complete crash of the Treasury stocks, etc. It would destroy the market. And she said that, um, that the majority of teachers and, and the people, when they saw what would actually happen, that uh, they voted to keep drugs illegal uh, and keep the money laundering going on. So I've talked a lot about money laundering and where the money goes. Uh, obviously it doesn't go through Bitcoin. It, it may be getting closer to be able to go through Bitcoin. Uh, and we know that BTCE was charged with money laundering, but that wasn't money laundering uh, unless they were selling for currency. Um, I don't know whether they were or not. I know they did have dollars on there at one point, uh, so you, I guess you could sell for dollars, but they weren't. it wasn't the money that was being laundered. Supposedly it was the Bitcoin being laundered. That's a very gray area. For example, on Poloniex, there are no dollars, so I'm not really sure how you could launder money. Um, but if they say launder Bitcoin, then I guess they consider Bitcoin to be money. And uh, then they've kind of admitted it there. But the question is with Apple, is there some kind of laundering going on? Is it a kind of a front company? Um, back to that Solaris, one thing that she cited in her documents was how many businesses that she found that seemed to not really do business, whether it was a Hardee's restaurant at the edge of town, never seemed to have any traffic or some other business. If you watch that Ozark, you'll see he comes down there and he's looking for businesses to, that are in trouble that he can buy so that he can launder that money. So a business doesn't really have to make a profit for you to use it as a money laundry. So the question is, is that the US government laundering treasuries or something worse going on with Apple? Well, I wanted to look at some of the numbers here. Uh, so again, here's the stock price, uh, 156, and the market cap is uh, over 800 billion dollars, 807 billion dollars. Uh, but let's look at the market share. Now here's the smartphone market share. Uh, their market share has been shrinking. 
since 2012 when it was 6.16.6 .6, and that's of a of a pie that also the non-android share is shrinking so android is growing android was 69 percent it's now 86 percent apple was 16.6 percent .6%. it's now 12.9 percent of the smartphone market so they're definitely in a downtrend of their share uh, what about pcs what about laptops well you can see here that uh, these are the top pc and laptop uh, sales market share you can see that lenovo has a 21.3 percent market share hp comes in at 20.9 dell is 14.7 asus which is what i have i really like asus 7.4 and apple is down here with 7.1 percent 7.1 percent now what else does apple do i i can't imagine that itunes or ipods or stuff like that is going to be very big so the two biggest markets for apple one they're less than 10 percent market share the other one they're around they're less than 15 percent market share so how does apple have an 800 billion dollar market cap and how does apple or why does apple have so many u.s treasuries and they're increasing it so interesting story i don't know the answer to it obviously the apple chart is either near parabolic uh, or in the process of going parabolic this is one of the biggest bubbles if not the biggest stock bubble that we've ever seen we're starting to surpass the nasdaq we're starting to surpass the 2007 2008 uh, stock market bubble and if you remember when those bubbles are happening like right now you can go through the reasons people can say well apple their stuff is great everybody loves apple the apple stores are cool if you remember that kind of feeling or vibe that you had back during the dot-com days uh where yeah it makes sense yeah i can understand that but if you remember when it turned and it went south then all the other reasons just started to come into play and these are some of the reasons here well they only sell this much their stuff is overpriced and then but it's that's the way sentiment works so when the sentiment turns then all of a sudden these things become important bull markets ignore negative news um, and bear markets ignore positive news this is my opinion the tail end of the bull market but we just don't know where it's going to end so back to the silver chart we're back in the smackdown mode and that SmackDown mode hopefully is going to present an opportunity. Again, I said when Bitcoin hit around 27, 2800 and silver was down around uh, 15 or so, that it was a time where some people might want to look at going to JM Bullion or going to um, a Provident Metals where you can get a good price on physical silver, trade some crypto for it. We may have another opportunity here, an even better one, where if we get sub $15 silver and we get higher than $4,000 Bitcoin, uh, just promise me that you're not going to shoot me if Bitcoin races to $100,000 and you bought silver with it. I don't know how high it's going to go before it crashes. It definitely did not do a 90% crash on this one. It did about a 40% uh, correction. Uh, and so... We haven't had another big 90% crash. That still could be around the corner, and we'll talk to you next time.